The first thing before anything happens at all is kind of going back to what are we trying to achieve? What's the business imperative? Are we trying to reduce costs? Are we trying to increase productivity? That has to be very clearly defined and understood. The second thing after that is making sure that the leadership is in alignment. Then after that, you have the communication. So each work stream gets essentially a supervisor or leader that's assigned to that work stream. That's on the part of the structure. Rishi, thanks so much for jumping on and volunteering to be part of my Systems Thinking podcast series. So as I mentioned in the introduction letter, like it's a perfectly candid conversation. We've only messaged a couple of times on LinkedIn, but so like, let's, let's get into it. So I always like to open these conversations with just a little bit of a back and forth introduction. So obviously, you know, a little bit about me. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Like, where did you get, like, where did you come from? What are your, what are your interests and that sort of thing? And we'll just go from there. Sure. Thank you so much, by the way, for having me on your show. Really appreciate it. So my name is Rishi Patel. I've been in North America about 20 something years. I'm originally from Bombay, India. I moved to the U.S. 20 years ago, got my MBA. And then I've pretty much been in management consulting for most of my career. Till, till pretty recently, till about, I would say, five to seven years ago when I really got interested in actually the applications of artificial intelligence to business problems. And that's what I've, I've been doing for, for the now, now about seven years. Excellent. So, you know, as, as, you know, systems thinkers, as someone who has come from, I mean, I, I guess let's start there, like, it, you know, crossing, crossing cultures. Uh, obviously, there in in America, in England, in in the West, there is a a lot of immigration from India. I've worked with lots of people either still in India, Hyderabad, other places, but then coming to America. So, I guess the 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 very first thing I want to know is like, what are the cultural differences that you experienced or or that or that you learned, and and more and I don't know now, but more importantly, but how has that shaped kind of your trajectory? So I, I think it really depends on where, where in India you're from. So what I mean by that is like, I grew up in Bombay, which is, or Mumbai, which is a pretty big city and it's, it, it was always very westernized. So I grew up westernized and I grew up kind of with the influence of, you know, listening to Guns N' Roses and, you know, watching, uh, you know, watching the Wonder Years and things like that, right? So it's it's a very different experience when you come from that to uh, to, to to the U.S. as opposed to some you know a, a relatively smaller town where it's it's very where the culture is so different. Uh, so for me, it was almost like actually actually like a reverse culture shock because when I first landed here, I landed in New York and that was awesome, loved it, Lo- you know, it felt exactly like what I expected America to be. But then I hop on a on on a plane and I go to where my university was, which is somewhere in Virginia, a small town. And it was almost like a reverse culture shock because, you know, the bus ran once every hour or, or two hours on the weekend, and just w- not what I was expecting. I mean, th- there were there were no buildings taller than three floors. I think like three floors was the highest, and it, that to me was more of a culture shock than anything else. But, you know, also, I think what I learned very quickly was the value of, of individual, individual freedoms here that, that, this, that America or North America in general affords, which, which was, you know, a pleasant surprise to me. Because in India, there's a lot of expectations that you have to follow, no matter what stage of life you're in, what, what, what profession you're in, etc. So, so for me, that was like a, almost like a revelation and a, a pleasant revelation at that. Interesting. So, I mean, there, there's so much to unpack there. One, I just, I think it's hilarious that like you, you kind of grew up with like Guns N' Roses, you know, you listening to Gunners and then you get to New York City or, or New York State. I don't know if it was New York City. And it's like this, it kind of felt familiar. But then you get to Appalachia and it's very different. And that's, I mean, that's, you yeah. know, I, I grew up going to the uh, the mountains of Virginia. My grandfather has a cabin up there. Uh, yes, very, very different culture. Probably lots of uh, cow pastures near the university, if I had to guess. So, you know, well, let's let's follow that thread a little bit and then we'll we'll get to like AI and business management because that's obviously very interesting and very timely. But one of the things that you said that was was a pleasant surprise 
was the the importance of individual freedoms here versus I guess where you grew up in India, where I, I think the way that you said it was there's like some some expectations to be followed, um, and I guess it's more cultural expectations or maybe family expectations. What what was your experience there in terms of the structure, the system, the lifestyle? You know, what are all the patterns of differences that you notice between there and here? So I, I think the fundamental, when I say expectations, uh, cultural as well as familial, et cetera, it's, it's almost like you have to have certain trajectory in your life, otherwise you're a failure. So it's like, you know, if, you, if, you're, if you haven't gotten, gotten uh, an engineering degree or, or, a, or, a, or a computer science degree or, or you're not a doctor, then it's almost like you're a failure. <laughs> or you have to, you know, you have to get married at this age and you have to do this and that. And, you know, when I, when I moved to, to America, I was like, hey, wait a second, I can actually pursue really any path that I want. You know, like I had never, for example, I had never really heard of management consulting before or, or you know, I didn't really know what it was. But when I learned about it, I was like, yeah, that's something that is of super, would be of extremely, you know, a big interest to me. Whereas culturally, like I would have been expected to try to join a, a large firm and kind of work my way up there on the ladder there. And, you know, like it's, it's a very traditional set path. And if you deviate from that path, it's, it's, it's almost like you're kind of ostracized from society. You know, this is, this is interesting because this is something that, that I think about a lot. And that is that, you know, in many cases, you know, there, whether it's a family pattern or a local pattern or national, like our societies, our cultures have some kind of default paths or, or expected trajectories for us. You know, like in America, we have, we have slash had the American dream, which is, you know, you grow up, you go to college, you get a job, you settle down in the suburbs, so on and so forth. It's a very, very kind of like well-established, well-trodden path, but more and more like, you know, it's not working for people or we're changing it or we're, you know, deviating from the path. And so it's interesting is that, you know, like, cause that, that's a social system, right? That is, that is a, a socially constructed and reinforced set of like milestones, right? By this age, you should have, you know, two children and a wife or this age, you should have be this far in your career. And there's only a few, you know, I, idealized careers, I guess. So, you know, like when you, when you, have, having had that life experience, having had that trajectory and picked something that really resonated with you because that like you're, you're paying attention to a signal, right? There was something like maybe it was emotional or intellectual or maybe even social. Maybe you found the right people. So what was, what was the signal that you heard or felt that made you say like, Hey, this career path is actually what's right for me. What, what resonated there? So I should kind of take a step back. So before I moved to America for two years, I had kind of started my own small web solutions firm. I was doing that. So I had a sense of independence. You know, this is, I'm talking about the year 1999 to 2001 approximately. Uh, so I had a lot of freedom. I, I, I really enjoyed taking on different challenges, taking on different, meeting new people and kind of that problem solving, right? So when I learned about, management consulting and what what it entails and what people do it was just very intriguing to me because i was like that's exactly what i want to do i want to basically find problems that are not necessarily simple talk to people find out what their real issues are and try to solve them and and that just resonated a, a lot as compared to you know like going to the same old same old same old job same old kind of career path and that was that was it to me like hey i get to get to actually meet people get to solve different problems get to travel all over the us uh us and canada and i just love that so you you said a few things one one reminds me of kind of a mantra that i came up with a, a while ago which is that uh, any any problem is solvable when you have the right people in a room talking to each other so would you would you kind of agree with that as a as a consultant and as a as a management consultant? Hundred percent. I mean, that's really one of the ways to to get to some of the root causes of these issues, these large issues that that we regularly deal with. Uh, when you get the right people in the room that have different backgrounds, different experiences, come have different viewpoints, and when you kind of bring that together, that's when you really get to 
what's the real problem here? So it's, you know, kind of alludes to the, or, or is somewhat tangential connected to the systems thinking, right? Which is how do you really get to what's the bigger picture? What's the fun, more fundamental issue that you're trying to address and not trying to fix just a symptom of the potential problem? Well, you know, and so when you, when you, when you're tackling these, these problems, like maybe, maybe, maybe now would be a good time for a story. Like what's, what, what's a story that you have, you know, from, from your, from your consulting career trajectory or, or, you know, career experience where you had some of these more complex problems, the ones that really kind of get you stimulated. Cause it sounds like you're, you're a lot like me where more complicated problems are very interesting and you just kind of feel more more energized. So what was, what was a good story around that? Like, what were the right people? What was the mystery? Like, how did you get to that? Okay. So I have tons of those, by the way, <laughs> let me think about one that might be of interest. Okay. So I did a project, this is about, I don't know, seven to 10 years ago, something like that in a coal company, uh, like a 150 year old coal company, uh, somewhere near Pittsburgh. And what we were tasked with was we, we, you know, we were given the problem of this company was spending close to fifty million dollars in transportation annually, uh, the transportation spend. So we won't, we were tasked with how can you can you reduce the transportation spend because it's 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 a lot. So we kind of started, you know, the eighty twenty rule, looking at what's the biggest buckets of spend and you know what are some of the opportunities, and we just realized that there is something called truck detention, and I had no idea what that meant. Uh, so I started kind of asking around, what does truck detention mean? And it turns out that if a truck is waiting to load or unload, and if it's a third party truck, if it goes beyond a certain allocated time, whether it's 30 minutes or an hour, et cetera, it starts to get incur a fee. And, you know, the fee might be 250 an hour, 300 an hour. So it doesn't sound like a lot for some of these companies, but when you add all of that up, it was something in the order of, uh, I would say a couple of a couple million, three million, something like that, and and that obviously it adds up, right? And it's pure waste because it's it's just money that you're not you're just throwing down the down the drain basically. So that was a good bucket to try and try and kind of start and capture. So I first started talking to the transportation director and kind of get get her opinion on you know what what is the potential problem, and one of the remarks that she made was. Yeah, you know, it's it's a problem. I, I know it's a problem. And, you know, some of the, the loaders are so lazy and they, you know, they, they, they just don't you know, necessarily, uh, they, they are not up. They don't know when the truck is there, etc. So what we should do is we should just put up an alarm so that when the truck arrives, they can, you know, they, they will know that the truck is there and the bell keeps ringing and, you know, till they answer it, right? So I was like, okay, sounds like a reasonable hypothesis, but why don't we actually investigate that? Why don't we actually verify that? So we, I drove in her car, we sat outside of uh, the factory and actually for three hours in the morning, we actually noted down trucks going in and out and noted the timings and when, the, you know, how much do they wait and how much do they leave, et cetera. So we did, did kind of a verification. And then after that, what we realized or, or what I had data to, to show was that sometimes when the, when a truck arrives, it's not just one truck. There might be three trucks arriving. And at the same time, there might be a rail car arriving. So it's not like the, that the, the loaders were lazy. <laughs> it's just that they're overwhelmed because, you know, you, you got like a bunch of trucks loading and they have no option to, to, to do anything besides let the other, uh, the, the other, uh, truck or the rail car wait. So what I realized that it, this is basically more of a scheduling issue than anything else. What if we could schedule better? What if we could actually schedule the third party to make sure that the, the trucks arrive don't you know arrive in a staggered manner and not not arrive all all of them at once, right? And that was one of the hypotheses. And then we the other thing related to that was. It would that that detention bill. They would sometimes take about three weeks before you saw the bill. And so, if if your supervisor is looking at that bill after three weeks, it's very hard to figure out what really happened that day and, and do any kind of analysis on it or try to make any improvements on it. Right. One of the other things we realized was that the gate the gate entry uh, actually had timestamps of every truck entering and, and exiting. 
So from that, we were actually able to calculate the detention beforehand, right? Before we actually see the bill, we were, we were able to calculate the, the detention right there and have that as a report to the supervisor that same evening. So now you have a much shorter interval control that says I can analyze what happened today and maybe I can take proactive steps to address that or prevent that. So as a whole, collectively, by looking at scheduling and by doing a more proactive look at how do you track that, we were able to cut down their detention. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was somewhere in the order of 50 to 60% from where they started. And, you know, that was, again, like, a, I mean, obviously there were other other people, it wasn't just me, that they were, they were looking at logistics and movement of goods, et cetera. But that was an area that was literally money that was just being thrown down the drain that we were able to capture and, and actually utilize. So, you know, that, that's, that's one example of how if you talk to the right people and kind of correlate that with actual observations to get to the root cause, uh, the result is better than just taking things at face value. There's so much to unpack there. So first, thanks. That's a, that's a fantastic story. Perfectly illustrates many of the concepts, um, not just in systems thinking, but organization and, and, and investigation. So, you know, you talk to the right people, you come up with a hypothesis, you gather information. This is all like relatively straightforward principles, like you know, basic concepts. Um, what, in your experience, you know, why, why is it that, that you would need to bring in an expert? So what I mean by that is why couldn't this transportation director, why didn't, why didn't she figure it out on her own? Is it, it, was it just a matter of perspective or inertia? Like maybe there's some institutional or organizational inertia and she just didn't think to look, or she had made an assumption, you know, her assumption sounds like the workers were lazy and there's nothing you can do about that except maybe pay them more or, you know, punish them or whatever. But it was, in this case, it was very little that the workers had control over. So what, like, what's the gap there? And, and, and you know, what, what could other organizations or other people do to, to identify those gaps? So this is, okay, so this is just my personal opinion based on my experiences. But what I feel is that companies and people tend to get into a rhythm and tend to get into, you know, the status quo, right? And no matter where you are in the hierarchy, you do, generally don't want to rock the boat. So you got your job, you got a set of defined things that you need, that you are given as your task. It's very hard to take a step back and say, okay, I'm going to spend the next seven days investigating something that I wasn't originally tasked with. No, nobody's getting paid for that. And unless you are, you know, unless you're hired within an organization as specifically a continuous improvement manager or some, some, something of that nature, it, it's really hard for people to kind of step away from their job, take a big picture view and, and say, these are the things I'm going to resolve. Most companies, unless you are, you know, some of the top, top companies in the US that, that have all, everything figured out. Unless you are one of those companies, the rest of the companies, you, you got very, very set, defined set of rules, roles and responsibilities. People are assigned those roles and responsibilities and people tend to perform to those expectations. And, and that's why I feel like you need that external view, external perspective, which not only addresses, provides a different perspective, but also that person has the freedom to that's their job. Like it, they have the freedom to to kind of take a big picture view and say, I'm going to talk to these ten people. I'm going to look through these departments. I'm going to look th through this systems or this data or these Excel reports or these PDF files. Right? You, you generally, if if that's your role and that's your task, then you're you're able to do that. But otherwise, it's it's very difficult when you're entrenched entrenched in that. You know, you know, like for, for the example that I gave, this person, this transportation director, she's super smart and she, you know, she knew her business. So she performed to the, the roles that she was expected to perform, but it was hard for her to step, take a step back and look at something outside of her, her day to day activities. Yeah. No, and it makes perfect sense. Like, you know, people tend to stay within the boundaries 
of their defined role. You know, there's there's the the racy matrix, right? The responsible, accountable, you know, so on and so forth. And and so then what you're saying is is really the solution or part of the solution is is creating a structure, right? Like you have to you have to you have to have someone who comes in with a with a systematically or structurally different set of objectives, outcomes, responsibilities. And so because you came in with a different set of incentives, it, it was it was your job to optimize this or to find a problem or to look at it differently. And so because you're coming in with a fundamentally different point of view, you're able to see things differently. So that 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 makes sense and it it, it kind of all comes down to like what is the outcome that you're paid for or what are you being paid to achieve? Sorry, if I may add, you know, the so I was in the last whatever 20 years or so, I've been part of mostly mid to large size consulting companies, operations specifically operations consulting companies that have a program in place. So when they go in, it's not just they don't just arbitrarily send people. What they do is they really start at the top, uh, have a communication plan, have get the buy-in from the leadership, and then put a program in place. It could be a four months to six months, maybe sometimes eight months program that says, here's the different work streams that, that are going to be part of this program. Here, here are their objectives. And it's not just external people. So it's not just external consultants. What most of these companies did was or, or do is that they got for every one consultant from outside, they would get maybe two or three internal resources to work as part of that, that program. So it's, it's a very, it becomes a very collaborative approach. So it's not just like a strategy firm where you get the strategy, you know, you, you hand the strategy and you're gone. In operations consulting, what we did, most of these firms did was you, you build a collaborative program in, in which the clients feel that they are part of the solution. Not, not just feel, but they are made to you know, ensure that they, 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 they are part of that team. They are part of that solution. And that gets to much better results. And in, in, you know, the point I was trying to make is like, it's a structured program. It's not just uh, you kind of get thrown into the mix without in the deep end. It's, it's a full structured program that achieves that objective. So... I mean, either either using or creating structure to me is is a big component of of systems thinking. So, what what variables or factors or kind of rules or paradigms go into that structure? Because it sounds like you know for for the operations consulting that you're talking about, there is a lot of structure that you bring, right? That's part of what your service brings. Um, and it's it's interacting. So the, I, I guess taking a step back, there's a few structures. There's the existing client structure, like their existing business. So that's you know all the departments, all the people, all the roles. Um, you know, then there's every person who's involved has their own experience. There's the tribal knowledge, that sort of thing. Then there's the structure of your consulting firm, you know, your operations consulting firm. And then there's the structure of the project that you bring or that or that you create for them. So what are some of the key aspects or pillars of these structures that you pay attention to that you use to design the inputs and the outputs and how do you measure the effectiveness like let's 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 unpack some of that some of the the scaffolding and some of the framework there so i i think the first thing before anything happens at all is is kind of going back to what are we trying to achieve like what's the business imperative Right? Uh, are we trying to reduce costs? Are we trying to increase productivity? Are we trying to uh, make logistics more efficient? Whatever the imperative is, that has to be very clearly defined and understood. Because otherwise, you're trying to solve a problem that, you know, like it, it may not be in a vacuum. So it, it, we really have to always start from that. And then the second thing after that is making sure that the leadership is first of all bought into that. Because without leadership having bought into some of these implementations you don't get the you don't get the momentum so that's where you got to start with making sure that the leadership is in alignment and then work with them to to figure out okay so what departments should there be as part of this implementation and then of course we'll make recommendations as well like they may say well you don't need to talk to accounting and we'll say no no you you know we, we really need accounting for making sure we can look into where the truck detention costs are etc right so we'll make some there'll be some back and forth, but then you build that that structure. Then after that, you have 
the communication. Because unless you have a clear communication of, again, like what are we trying to do? What are the objectives? What are these different work streams and what are they trying to achieve? So you might have a work stream that's trying to improve productivity in, in, in the production line. There may be another work stream that's trying to reduce downtime on the, on the production line or some, somebody's trying to reduce transportation spend or improve logistics, whatever. You have these different work streams. So each work stream gets essentially a client leader, a supervisor or leader that's assigned to that work stream. So that's on the part of the structure. So that's the communication piece. And then we want to usually build a feedback loop that provides updates and reports and kind of direction at regular intervals. And that regular intervals might might differ for you know what level you are at. So the for the work stream, it might be you have a daily report and you have a daily meeting. But then maybe you have a weekly meeting with at at a one level about that. And then you have a maybe you have a steer executive leadership steering committee meeting that gets an update every two weeks or four weeks to make sure everything is on track. And then you you know you got to have the right key performance indicators KPIs that track the the measure or, or measure how far are you against what you said you you were going to be at. So right to so making sure that whatever objectives you started with. You got to make sure that you are actually achieving those objectives or at least having moving in the direction of achieving those objectives. And and that's kind of extremely important in in my view in making sure that this is is a success. So when you start off, it sounds like there's there's kind of two or three-ish kinds of things. And so one is you're trying to increase something or decrease something. So there's some there's some so some measurement, uh, whether it's productivity or costs or throughput. So there's there's a value you're trying to change, or there is a problem you're trying to overcome. There's some some blocker or or or. So I guess it, it it's that kind of like highest level, most abstract principle is those are kind of the two basic ways of looking at. It. Or maybe there's a third one, which is you're trying to achieve something. Right. Would you agree with kind of that that assessment? Yeah. T- typically, I, I think to your point, it's it's typically you're trying to increase revenues or reduce costs. Those are the two primary things. A third related one might be I'm trying to improve overall productivity. Productivity meaning, uh, it takes me, you know, like I, I, I'm I'm doing something very complex in in terms of my services or offerings, and it takes me ten days to get a contract or get a quote out. And can I reduce that time frame from 10 days to maybe five days or two days, right? That might be productivity gain that somebody's trying to achieve. And that could be another objective, which is not necessarily tied to financials. But the, the first two that I mentioned, which is you got to increase revenue or reduce costs at a high level, that's always tied to a, a very measurable financial metric that you can always tie back to. So no matter what you're doing, like, you know, improve productivity, well, you can always say my current product production is X, and now after doing so, my production is Y, and then I apply the the marginal cost of the product, and that's my savings of over what I achieve. Not savings. This is my revenue increase of what I achieve, or, or the other way around. Like if you're trying to take out costs, maybe I take out the cost of I used to spend hundred tons in raw material. Now I only it only takes me. 90 tons of raw material and the cost of raw material is is this therefore my savings are 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 why and that's how you kind of bring it back to the measurements and metrics for for anything unless you're doing something that's that's like more productivity and and in some cases it might be hard to measure but i i think you know that that kind of brings me to the the, the next things which is the evolution of technology has enabled in the in the last i would say you know 10 10 or so years 10 to 15 years to to have more objectivity to some of these measurements so when when i kind of started doing some of this you know 2006 2007 it was it was a lot of there was a lot of subjectivity to some of these measurements like we would you know sit sit on a line and do something called line studies where we're observing you know how long does it take for widget A to go from this uh, production line to the end of that production line. 
and what's the average time, et cetera. And those were all, you know, there was some subjectivity to it. I mean, you had stop stopwatches and stuff like that. But the more objectivity that you can bring to it as a result of technology, the, the better the results are going to get because you now have data that, that is really truly represents what's actually happening in the system as opposed to like some human, human element of subjectivity that, that used to exist before. So it, it, it's what's really emerging to me as I'm, as I'm listening, you know, there's, there's something numbers, right? Whether it's a measurement, uh, you know, KPI, money, time, what you're saying is a huge component of all this is measuring the right things and then optimizing those measurements. So with those tight feedback loops and KPI, you need to make sure that you have the right KPI. And I want to ask about that in a second. Like, how do you, how do you identify a good measurement? And then of course, you're probably familiar with Goodhart's law, which is the moment that you measure something, it becomes a bad measurement or whatever. So let's talk about that in a second. So, but, but the number one principle here is measure. What are you measuring? Right. And, and sometimes it's not obvious. And this is, this is, I think, one of the most interesting things about systems thinking and about problem solving more broadly is, for instance, the scheduling problem, right? It was, it was not necessarily obvious that the bottleneck was that you had three trucks arriving at once. You had to look at the right information. You had to go find the right information, talk to the right people, and then go measure it. Um, and you know, you you come up with a hypothesis, you test the hypothesis, and but and before we talk we, before we talk about measurements, um, I want to say that the, the to me what what seems like emerging the second main pillar is the people. So it's measurements and people, because the first thing that you said is leadership buy in, right? You need to talk to you need to talk to the you know the executives of the company that hired you, make sure they're aligned, make sure that they understand that they're communicating their expectations. And I'm sure that sometimes they ask for one thing, but you rec- you recognize they need another, right? <laughs> they they might not, you know, an example being like, oh, you don't need to talk to accounting. Well, maybe that was the problem is that they weren't they weren't talking to accounting the whole time. But then also one of the one of the most interesting things that you mentioned was placing people directly in the work streams to provide that constant feedback to communicate to like I'm guessing it's two way communication. So. Like, you know, hey, we're going to make this little change. I'm going to tell you that this change is happening at the work stream level. And then you get the feedback. Did it work? What changed? So on and so forth. But then it's, it's you know, downstream communication, upstream communication, lateral communication. So anyways, it, you know, measurements and people is kind of what's emerging is kind of the two big food groups here. What about the KPI or measurements? How do you, how do you make good measurements? And how do you, how do you know, how do you measure the measurements? Like, because I guess you have to measure the efficacy. Like, are you measuring the right thing and that sort of stuff? So let's let's dive into that a little bit. Uh, you know, I think fundamentally, I, I'll kind of take a step back and say that if you don't measure something, you definitely it's very hard to to improve it because you don't know where you stand, right? So you have to measure in order to improve. That's that's you know that's that's I think the fundamental thing. Now, how do you how do you uh, how do you start to measure? In my opinion, again, it, it kind of, I would, you know, we, we, we build something that we call a KPI tree. So KPI tree meaning, you know, if your initial objective was, I want to save, I want to improve uh, productivity or I want to save X million, you know, uh, let's say I want to take out 3 million in, 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 uh, in spending in transportation, right? So, okay, that's, that's a given, right? So then that's, that's your fundamental KPI at the top level. And from there, what are the other KPIs that build towards it? So it might be, okay, I want to look at truck detention. I want to look at the overall uh, truck movement spend. I want to maybe look at cost per mile because maybe maybe different providers give me different cost per mile when I'm transporting. So those might be KPIs that kind of are, are the second level. And there might be more fundamental, what I call, uh, KPIs that are leading indicators. So they are not necessarily tracking that particular KPI, but maybe there's, there's a leading indicator. So in the example that I gave you, the report that's coming out of the gate, that's, that's, it's not an official report, but it's, it basically gives the downtime that happened today. And that's the amount of downtime, right? The, sorry, not downtime, the amount of dwell time, right? The, the truck sitting there. So it doesn't really have the cost because the costs are all different across all different carriers, et cetera. But I know the dwell time 
And from the dwell time, that's a leading indicator of what my actual cost of drug detention is going to be. So that's another KPI that if I measure today, that becomes a leading indicator of my financial number that's coming later. So it's, yeah, so we, we build what, what, what we call a KPI tree in which there's a cascade of KPIs that kind of roll up to the objective that you're trying to finally achieve. Okay. That, I mean, that that's fascinating to, to me. Like you systematically go through and, and, and create like a flow chart of KPIs. Like, so you have the, the main goal. So the main goal is the value that you're trying to change, whether, like you said, it's, it's generally the top line or the bottom line. Um, but then there's subsidiary or secondary KPI, like, you know, if you can have something go faster, time is money, right? So like, if something happens faster, then that's generally going to be good for probably the top line, if I had to guess, because it's, it's gets out the door faster, you get the product or service to customers faster. Um, and but then there's even there's 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 components of those that all contribute. So I guess maybe tributary KPI or, or something, but I can very easily imagine the tree. And so then there's a temporal component, right? So there's, 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 uh, cause things are not necessarily true at all times, right? Whether or not there's a truck in the loading dock or whether or not the truck is in transit. Um, but then there can, there can also be ripple effects that are disconnected. So one thing you mentioned earlier was, sh- uh, how did you word it? I think like shortening the feedback cycle or the iterative cycle. So like if you get the report three weeks later, you don't necessarily know why the detention was too high or the, the the fees were too high. But if you connect that to the gate times, so how do you connect? It's because it, it seems to me like one of the hardest things is not just laying out all the KPI that are or all the measurements that are available, but maybe identifying measurements that aren't being made um, and then correlating those across time and space. So let's talk about that because that, that I think is, um, and if you've got any stories about that, that could be really interesting. Yeah, I mean that that's a concept called short interval control, which is you know the the if if you're trying to steer a ship and if that ship you know you only measure it every four hours, and if there's a there's a deviation in that you know the, or there's a drift in that by measuring it only four hours, you could be off by a mile or two miles, right? If if you if you correct it course corrected and if you measure where you are maybe every minute or or so your drift is going to be much lower and i mean that's always necessarily true like there's always the right frequency for measurement for some some things there's also such a thing as measuring too often but in in general if you match the frequency to how often a something is changing or some kpi is changing then the short interval control will enable you to better control it uh, and take proactive steps to address it in, in time or before before time. That reminds me. So in my past life as an infrastructure, IT infrastructure engineer, I was obsessed with best practices and detecting problems before they were problems. And so I would have, you know, services that would, you know, look at all the systems that I was responsible for and show me alerts and errors and stuff. And I don't know why, but for for many IT people, they just ignore those. It's like you have systems that have critical alerts and, you know, you basically react, you wait until something breaks and then the fire alarm goes off and then you scrambled. And I'm like, but what if you prevent the fires? And so for me, like one of the things that I would measure is like number of alerts, number of alarms, any any KPI, any any errors that could be fixed. And so I would have dashboards and I'm like, the correct number of errors is zero. So how can I trend towards zero? <laughs> because it's like, and you know, when, when people would first start, you know, when we'd first set up a dashboard, it'd be like, you know, 8,000 alarms. And it's like, well, that's too overwhelming. It's like, well, one of those is going to blow up though. <laughs> so let's, how do we get that to zero? So that, that's kind of like an operational view of like, okay, what is the correct one measure the right thing and then take action about it. And of course that's, that's my, my past life. But I, I appreciate talking about like the interval control, like shorter interval controls and optimizing. How often do you look at this? And so for me, I would I would have a report generally once a week, but I'd have a dashboard that I'd check every morning just to make sure things are moving in the right direction. That's excellent, excellent stuff. Let's let's move to the people side of it. So a, a, as I'm as I'm talking to more systems thinkers, what I'm realizing is that systems thinking is is 
first and foremost, people thinking is, is kind of one of the things that I'm learning. And so, you know, you start with the executive leadership, you start with the key stakeholders, all the departments. So you've got, you've got some, you've got some natural silos, right? The accounting people don't necessarily need to be talking to the, the doc workers. It's your job to, to go across those silos. Um, so you've got, you've got a lateral view as well as a vertical view and an outside view, but you're talking to a bunch of different people and then you've got outside vendors. And so I guess let's start at the beginning. You, you mentioned a, a little while ago about making sure that you get buy-in at the leadership level. Um, and then it goes, goes from there. So what are all the other stakeholders and the relationships and kind of the, the people systems aspect of all this? So I think uh, breaking those silos is, is, is really critical. Breaking silos of communication across departments is, is, is super important, in my opinion. So after we kind of get leadership buy-in, after the communication is, is done, uh, we then make sure that those work streams that are assigned for each, each area or each department is staffed with people that, are, that have either, you know, going by the RACI principle, who's responsible for something, who's accountable for something, who needs to be consulted and who needs to be informed. So we gotta we make sure that there's at least one of each representation there in that in that in that uh, work stream. So if if you know if if you need to make sure that uh, shipping needs to be consulted while you're trying to address uh, production, then we gotta make sure or we will make sure that there's a person that represents shipping in those discussions and whether they are part of that on a daily basis or maybe we just involve them on a you know as needed basis or maybe once a once a week but we're going to make sure that that representation is there because without that representation uh there's there's a big disconnect and the same thing goes for you know more 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 and more these days you got to have IT buy-in you got to have IT involvement you got to have you know technology involvement because it's it's really hard to separate out these days, any anything that you're doing in the factory or in a uh, in a company without make, without IT's involvement, so that's kind of another big area. We, we want to make sure that there's buy-in on all sides before you kind of move too far down the down the road. There, I really I, I had never heard it described like that because typically in the past when I have engaged with you know a racy matrix, it's usually a particular system or a particular business domain. But what you're saying is you actually apply the RACI principle to the work stream, to each step of, of the process. And so what you're talking about is actually creating creating structural lines of communication by looking, okay, who, who at each part of the workflow or the work stream needs to be responsible, accountable, consulted, or informed about a particular thing. And this, so this goes from top down left to right across silos so is that is that part of well let me ask it this a different way when when you're you know doing a doing a, a consultation and you're trying to solve a problem how do you identify when there is communication should be happening that isn't cuz that i think that's probably one of the most perennial problems in businesses how do you know how do you make sure the left hand is talking to the right hand at any given you know step of the process in in the us this has been uh, in operations consulting this has been around for almost 70 years so i didn't invent it uh, you know none of the companies that i worked with invented this but there's a principle called management operating system and management operating system essentially is is not technology it's it's a system of making sure that there is communication at the right levels, at the right frequency, and that there's there's a complete loop. So it almost starts, you know, in the olden days, they would really start start with a, a brown paper on the wall and then start putting together, here are the meetings, here are the levels, here's the the frequency at which, you know, at which these meetings occur. So you, you start with like quarterly, uh, monthly, weekly, daily meetings, and then kind of draw a full loop of, of those meetings and, and what are the inputs and outputs of those meetings. So when you kind of do that exercise, it's often very easy or very apparent to look at what's missing. And you might, you know, you, you might look at it and go, you know, there's supposed to be forecasting, forecast control, a report, et cetera. And I'm missing the report loop for this meeting at this level. So maybe we need to actually install a meeting 
that that communicates that back to the right stakeholders. So maybe there's a planning meeting that's missing for actually for, for procurement, right? You're not procuring at the right time because you don't know what your forecast is. And maybe that's a meeting that was missing. Maybe there's redundancies in meetings where you have two or three meetings that are doing the exact same thing, except they're in different silos. And we, we might go look at that and say, why can't we combine these meetings where you're talking about the same thing and you look at the same reports, but why have one for sales ops, one for ship, shipping, one for procurement, one for production, while when they are talking the exact same thing. So this should be just really maybe one meeting. And and that's that's a way of, of kind of identifying some of those gaps as well as redundancies in that communication. And again, like I, I didn't invent it. It's been around for at least the last 70 years in the U.S., in the operations consulting space. Now, meetings are, are are often considered the bane of people's existence. I remember my my boss at my last job, my last corporate job, he showed me his calendar once and it was back-to-back meetings all day, every day almost. And to me, that seems like there are some redundancies, almost certainly if you're spending all day talking to people, unless it's your job. Um, but as as a manager of, of people, I imagine it wasn't his not supposed to be his full-time job. But what so what it, kind of what you're saying is that there are there is an appropriate an optimal amount of meetings with the correct stakeholders. So like I guess what are all the key inputs because you have to have the right people in the room talking. You have to have the right cadence or frequency. Um, you have to have a correct agenda like you said maybe it's a forecasting or several other agendas. So what are all the correct like, structural inputs or structural decisions to have an optimal meeting? Because uh, it, it sounds like it serves a very critical purpose in operations. So there, so what are what are all the key inputs? First of all, we, we what we do is we we have like a almost like a objective or a goal for the meeting. So we create like this small PowerPoint slide or or a word document or that that states here's the goals of the meeting. Here's the, the the people that are in attendance. Here's the inputs that you need to bring. Here's the output of that meeting. And essentially, you know, that that's kind of the almost like a like a yeah that, that's the first step you set a goal and then you make sure that those goals are those objectives are actually followed through you have the right people in the room they bring the right sets of inputs you have the right discussions and everything is 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 measured so it's not just a free discussion where i i just want to talk about you know safety issues you, you gotta have some in you know some objectives of what are we talking about why are we talking about this and what are we trying to achieve out of that? And making sure that it's connected to that objective that's set. You, you know, I would call it a meeting charter, a, a charter of a meeting, and then follow that charter to make sure that the meeting is essentially a success. And then initially, we would also measure the meeting effectiveness by kind of having a checkbox that that says, you know, where the right people in the room where the object is followed, where did the meeting start and stop on time, et cetera. So you kind of have a meeting effect and a score that you also provide to coach and help impl- you know, help improve those meetings. But you know, if, if I may kind of veer off track a little bit, the, the what I'm really excited about is I think there's a, and that's what I've been doing now for the last four years or so, there's a lot of artificial intelligence that can help in many of these aspects. And that's, to me, is super exciting because now you can take inputs that are that were pr- primarily just people talking and convert it into nice summaries that you can now actually have maybe an LLM analyze and figure out, you know, here's the inputs, here's the outputs, what decisions sh- could be potentially made from it. I'm not saying the LLM, you should have the LLM make a decision necessarily right, right away. But maybe it can help you actually figure out, like, here's the decisions that that could be potentially made. And then you have a human in the loop that says, yeah, that's right or that that's not, not right. And now, you know, maybe initially you cut down the meeting from 60 minutes to 15 minutes. And eventually maybe you eliminate that altogether because maybe you just, you just people just send voice transcripts or the right inputs in various formats. It could be Excel files, PDF files, et cetera. And to me, that's that's the real the next boundary of what's what's really exciting about all of this. How do you combine uh, like operations with with technology to take it to the next level? One way of looking at AI, particularly from an operations perspective, it's an it's an information processor. 
it's it's a tool that can help either process information or participate in automation or a little bit of both is is a good way of looking at it. So pivoting pivoting to that topic, like where do you see it going? What are you working on? Like what's what like have you seen it materially affect outcomes yet or are you kind of working towards that? Where's where is AI right now? So okay, just taking a quick step back, I, I think like, you know, in my so 20, 20 so years in, in management consulting and then seven or so years in like applying AI to kind of solving these problems. What I realized is there's a big disconnect typically in people who come from a pure business background and people who come from a pure technology background. And they often don't talk the same language. They, they don't, they often, they don't even have the same goals. And what we've been trying to do for the last, I would say seven years is trying to bring those people together. And, and say, okay, if you're trying to achieve an objective of, you know, the, the example like improving drug detention or another example is we improve productivity of number of bags produced for a food manufacturer in the Pacific Northwest. And whatever those objectives are, if you put on your business hat and you put on a technology hat, what are the different things that that you're seeing as as an as from that perspective that if you combine you know you you get better results so just to give an example for for the food for the food manufacturer if if you're if you were doing this this, this is a project we did about 3 years ago and if we had done this project maybe 10 years ago we would be pu- looking at pure purely from a perspective of you know what are the downtimes what are the people bottlenecks, what are the process bottlenecks, et cetera. And, and that's a good good way to start. That's a good point of point of starting. But because we had also put on our technology hats, we realized, hey, wait a second, there's actually information that is stored inside the PLs or, or the production line that has the weight of every single bag that's produced on the network and the time and the timestamp. So from that, we can actually get down to the to the, the second level and down to the grams of what that bag weighs and any deviation from it and when was it produced. So from that, we were able to actually calculate all of the components of what we call OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, that measures basically rate, quality, and rate, quality, and availability, inverse of downtime. So having a perspective of where we were actually able to use technology to, to get that information and then the next part was actually training a simple deep learning algorithm to figure out if you have a bunch of sensors, what are, you know, can you predict your quality downtime or quality and downtime in the next half an hour or next two hours? Uh, so that was like, again, very basic, but this is about three years ago. And, but, but when you have that combination of, of having the business perspective, business view and a technology view, the results are much better, in my opinion, than anything that you can do individually. So to, to answer your question, which is where is AI today? I think what AI is missing is the true business applications in industry, at least, you know, I, I can't speak for other countries, but in North America, US and Canada, I feel like other than the big boys, you know, the Apples and the Walmarts and the Amazons, we are the rest of the, the manufacturing sector or, you know, industry is, is, is lagging behind and in their adoption. And that adoption, th- th- there's several causes of this. I mean, I could talk for another two hours on that, but I, I think that, you know, the, the fundamental disconnect is, is again, starting with you have the people that are, have a, a business view and you have people that have a tech view. And it's very hard to bring that 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 those people together. So one of the things that that I'm doing or we are doing in my company is is trying to build that from the ground up, which is we have people that are operations experts and AI experts and and technology experts and kind of trying to bring that from the ground up and say how do you look at this holistically as a problem and 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 identify what are the business aspects that we can that we should be looking at. And what are the technology aspects of having some of these advanced technologies at our disposal that were literally science fiction 10 years ago, <laughs> right? And, and, and now, you know, like as an example, I can, I can process like 
80,000 customer service records to get insights from, you know, what what somebody, what uh, the market is saying about their products or saying about their their issues. And it's just such valuable insights that would have taken literally hundreds of thousands of dollars, several months, and, and, and a ton of people to get that kind of information even 10 years ago and now you can do that literally with you know with just like a, you you put like a simple model there and you get the <laughs> you get the result there and that's true for almost everything that i can every single business application that i think that i can think of so if you're trying to reduce downtime you're trying to increase improve quality improve the forecast when you take that combination of you know what if i i can look at my last five years of, of historical demand and train a train a simple ML algorithm on it that takes other things as inputs besides just the last historical value. And we find that that gets much better results in terms of, you know, mean, mean absolute percentage error or however you measure accuracy than if you were to just look at, yeah, I'm just going to look at the last two years and do some maybe some moving averages or you know, some, and, and that's what a lot of companies use. So even the more sophisticated ones today, they, they, they still, you'd be surprised that they still, for forecasting, they use things like moving average, exponential moving average. Maybe the, some of the more sophisticated ones use ARIMA, that's the autoregressive integrated moving average. Uh, but then, you know, there's not a lot of companies that are going beyond using historical records to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm digressing, but if I take a step back, I think what I was trying to, the main point I was trying to make is that combination of using technology at the right levels in the right areas to, to, to get information that is, uh, that is more objective. So to, to reduce the subjectivity, subjectivity, subjectivity in that information and then bring the right set of people together that are looking at it is what is the impact of having a LLM for analyzing my meetings or analyzing my uh, my contracts that you know previously took me 10 days to process now i can analyze it and get the results in 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 like literally 5 minutes right if if you combine that then you're going to get much better results because now you you, you can start to re, re refine your business process around that new technology so you got those views that says, okay, you know, if I remove this bottleneck, I can make my business process different and, and I completely change it knowing what is possible. So that, that combination of knowing the technology enough to be able to combine it with, with the business process and having a, a right level of understanding of the, of the business itself, of, of the business process, of the business, the, the, the the the, the, re, the the details about the business itself that combination in my view gets gets you much better much better results and i'm i'm really excited about that because i feel like that's that's the future that combination of of this is business and technology i mean there's a few really key important principles that you you outlined here so first is the hybridization or bringing together of of the technology perspective or the technology people and the business people, because as you said, they have different, even even different language, different goals, different concerns, different points of view. But then you're talking about the actual implementation of AI and and getting more telemetry. And it's as as you mentioned, there's many machines, many workflows. They all generate data, or they all generate information. But what one of the things that artificial intelligence can do is it can give you either the ability to interpret that data that was otherwise would have taken too long to interpret or or was too complex to interpret manually via an excel spreadsheet and so it gives you it gives you new new sources of information new high value sources of information but really it sounds like the the main principle of what what do you do with all that information is reduce subjectivity is you know like if you've got if you've got you know a bunch of seemingly uncorrelated or maybe vaguely correlated data points, train a deep, deep neural network on it that will be able to discover the effects, be able to discover which, which variables are predictive versus which are irrelevant or spurious. Um, but then ultimately, the idea is you reduce the subjectivity, whether it's from the, from the, the factory line worker or the management, whatever, you know, the human fallibility, and you put a number to it. So the key thing, and, oh, and then like you said, you can also 
here, what was it you said? Like you can have 80,000 customer reviews and then rather than, rather than having, you know, a team of business analysts spend weeks reading all of it, you have an LLM read it all in five minutes, several times over and you ask questions and you, you correlate it. And so then, but that, again, that's, that's another thing of you're reducing subjectivity because it's no longer just a marketing person reading it or a you know, product owner reading it. It's you say, Hey, let's have this machine read all of it and then make it more consistent. So uh, would you, is my understanding correct in that, that reducing subjectivity broadly is kind of like, that's what you do with the numbers. That's kind of the goal of artificial intelligence here. Or is there more to it than that? That's that's primarily, that's, I would say, one of the goals, right? But then the second goal, which is, you know, we've only been doing that part for the last, I would say, eight months, nine months, because obviously LLMs didn't exist like a, or at least not to that scale, didn't exist like a, till like a year ago, right? Approximately yeah, before ChatGPT came out. But I think where we are going with, you know, so three years ago when we started uh, doing what we're doing, it, it was more about, to your point, reducing subjectivity, looking at so different sources of data, uh, whether it's from a machinery or whether it's from sensors or whether it's from, you know, whatever else, and, and trying to get more data out of it to make sure that you can make the right business decisions from that data, object to business decision from the data. I think where we're what's possible in the last being possible in the last, I would say, you know, nine months to a year with large language models is you can now potentially use them for decision making itself. And and we are not I, I don't think we are there yet, but that's where I think we are eventually moving. I mean, you know, one of the things that I was, I found very inspiring, uh, one of your videos you talked about the latent spaces on how LLMs are able to compress things into latent spaces and then expand on that. That was, that's really powerful because if you think about what that means is that, in my opinion, that means that there's a really good amount of understanding that's going on in the LLM to be able to compress and then expand it to that that level. So if you have that level of, Com- comprehension or understanding, I feel that if you have the right inputs, there's no reason why you couldn't, over time, start to actually enable decision making right from the LLM level. And and that's, to me, that's super exciting. And and again, I'm not saying we should go, go and, you know, yield control to an LLM tomorrow. But if you can start taking steps in that direction, I think that's where, in my opinion, that's the next evolution of where all of this is going. And now you have, you know, you have the right people in the mix still. Like right? I'm not saying you should take out humans at all. Like you should obviously have in the loop. But can you actually help them make better decisions that are supplemented by using LLMs that actually have a good amount of comprehension and can aid in decision making and maybe help reduce bias, help provide more objectivity to it. Etc. Okay, I, I'm starting to to kind of grasp where you're coming from. So I guess first, like, what kind of decisions are we talking about, and then what are some of the advantages? So it it sounds like, uh, you know, reduce bias, increase objectivity, but basically help humans make better decisions, and eventually maybe take over some of the decision making for humans. I guess presumably once machines are more consistent and consistently make better decisions. But what are the kinds of decisions that you're thinking about, like deciding what products to buy or deciding, you know, who to hire and fire? Like what sorts of decisions, business decisions are you thinking of? It's certainly not things that would affect, you, you know, humans. So definitely not hiring or firing decisions. But yeah, but but things like, you know, for example, right now we, we talked about where you use reports and you use reports that are generated maybe daily, weekly, and then somebody is looking at that report and making a decision, here's what I need to buy, here's what I need to procure, here's what I need to stock, here's what I need to produce, you know, in supply chain, in a SNOP department, uh, here's what I need to do in terms of shipping. Those are all decisions that are currently driven by usually tons and tons of reports and meetings and and all that. And there is inherently a lot of bottlenecks that are represented in that in that decision framework. Where I'm going with this is if you have the right inputs, you have the right source of information, and you have 
LLM agents that can essentially now have the you know the the, the ability to look five steps or ten steps beyond just the most immediate decision. Uh, why could we not have some of these reports and and automation go directly into the LLM? And it makes a recommendation. So it's not necessarily you're, you're not still giving it the trigger that you don't allow it to press the right button, but it's basically giving you you know based on the observations you need to procure from these ten vendors. You need to stock this amount at this these 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 factories. And, and again, I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, there are specialized software that have been doing this for last twenty years, right? So I'm not saying that this has not been done. What I'm saying is like the ability to bypass all of that and retrofit this into companies that didn't have any of this before. That's the more exciting thing. I mean, you always have had companies that. I'm pretty sure. Again, I'm not going to speak on behalf of any of any companies, but I'm pretty sure. Like, if you go to the the WalMarts or Amazons, they have a ton of processing power that's doing all of these decision decisions right now, and they've been doing it for the last 10, 20 years, right? But if you talk to a, a company that's I don't know 20 million or 50 million dollars in revenue, and you go and talk to them today and ask them how do they make this their decisions and how do they do all this X, Y, Z, you often find it's it's still today. It's all done in Excel. It's all done in like maybe some basic CRM and you have people printing out reports and making decisions. So I'm, I'm talking about right now, like we have clients today that are in that boat right now. And to me, the exciting part is what essentially AI in general enables you to do is essentially democratize access to some of these things that would have been the result of very sophisticated technologies or or very expensive technologies that would have only been accessible for 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 large companies right so if you're a big company yeah you can afford to spend you know maybe 10 million dollars on or operations optimize optimization software that does all of this automatically but what if I could take PDF reports and what if I could take Excel reports and, and, and voice transcriptions, convert that into essentially what something that an LLM can, can understand, which you, you can very easily do these days, and, and have a decision that can guide some of these smaller companies at a fraction of the cost of what it would, would have taken in the past to, for, for some of these things to, 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 to do. And, and that to me is the exciting part. Like in the next two years, or maybe maybe it's maybe it's going to be less than that. I don't know. You have the ability to really transform business across uh, across you know the whole of North America, o- obviously other countries as well. But I, I can't speak for other countries. I, I only know experience here. But that's exciting to me because now you have smaller companies, even mom and pop. Shops, you know, it could be maybe they're doing five million in revenues, and they have a ton of information stored in PDFs that they can't really do anything with. And now you can easily actually extract information from that. Have maybe a, a maybe some AI system actually ingest that and enable decision making that this person can you know can now have, and they don't have to spend five million dollars. Maybe they spend fifty thousand, or maybe they spend you know five thousand a month. I don't know. I'm just making up a number, but you know, at a fraction of what the price would have been just even five years ago or ten years ago, and that's that to me is truly exciting. So, so I appreciate like a, a, a few key key ideas. One, like you said, not you're not reinventing the wheel per se. These a lot of these practices are there for the companies that can afford it. You know, Amazon, for instance, they're famous for they know which products to place in which distribution centers because they look at the trends and so on, but they have the data and they have the, the, the discipline to, and by discipline, I don't mean like emotional discipline, but I mean, they've made it a business discipline to constantly ingest that data, to automate it, to operationalize it. Um, and so what you're, what you're really looking forward to is getting that big tech, that enterprise scale, uh, you know, data informatics, but give it, put it into the hands of, of everyone in, in terms of whether it's an automation capability or just, or even just, you know, reading the reports that you get on a daily basis and taking maybe maybe not taking it away from a human but empowering the people to make more informed decisions 
or faster decisions or better decisions or you know, all of the above, ideally. Um, and so, but you use the term, I think, I think you said a uh, decision bottlenecks. Um, is that, is that kind of a, is that like one of the things that you would expect to overcome uh, in the long run with AI is like, maybe, maybe there's, you're waiting on an expert to make a decision and it takes them time or there's too many decisions to be made. And so you have decision fatigue. Like what, do you, what, do you, what is, what is a decision bottleneck and how will, how do you, how do you think AI can or will like overcome that? Just as an example, if you, if you are a company that's selling some complex product or service offering, and it takes you as an example, it takes you, and, and this is, you know, I, I've observed this in, in, in some pharma companies as an example, it takes you 10 days to come up with a quote because you have to follow a bunch of, you know, you know, steps and you to have to refer to a bunch of different sources of information. So I'm looking at some PDF here. I'm looking at a SharePoint there. I'm, I'm trying to collect all that together. And if I have a system that allows me to at least access information much quicker and compile that information into something that I can then review. Uh, so you, you're still not eliminating the, 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 the key decision maker but you're enabling them to get have access to that information better, faster, quicker, cheaper. Now you can they can make that decision or they can get that uh, contra, uh, that that code out much faster than before. Or vice, you know, in the opposite direction, if I'm doing a uh, if I'm doing procurement and I have to look at ten contracts every day and I have to read through those contracts that are all maybe 50 pages each. And, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, are all the terms as I expected? You know, is there any deviations? Now you can just have an, you know, pass through that and say, he, you know, give me the exceptions to my standard, right? If there's an exception to this term from the standard, uh, you know, it's net seven instead of net 45 or whatever it is, just highlight that as an exception and maybe mark it as, as here's the difference. Now you suddenly enable them to, look through those 10 contracts in in an hour or less that as compared to 10 hours right and now you you can enable you've just enabled them to make a decision quicker because they they're not spending 10 hours looking through those contracts or the same thing could be for emails you know like maybe i need to refer to you know 50 emails before in order to actually make a decision on something that that i'm trying to do because i need to read up on what was the history of what happened here, or maybe I'm reading through Slack messages, maybe I'm reading through some notes that I've showed in my CRM. If you can actually have a large language model help with that and provide a succinct summary that I can use much more effectively, quickly. And again, obviously, I mean, you know better than anybody else, like there's a lot of issues over about hallucinations and all that biases that we need to address. But in general, I think as long as those issues are known and addressed, it helps to, it, th this would be a step in the right direction because now your decision-making abilities to people from data that previously would have consumed a lot of their, their, their mental bandwidth. And the less, the less you have to do that, the, the faster you, are, you, you can be at, at decision-making. I mean, I know people who, you know, who have like 500 unread messages or 5,000 unread messages, and there's no way they're going to catch up on all those email messages. And there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, inherent information that's in those unread messages that they're probably, they're not getting around to because it's like too overwhelming. And what if you could have a system that, you know, just allows them to extract key elements of that in a, in a nice you know, easy to consume manner. And, and again, obviously, there's a lot of like caveats to that. I mean, you, you got to ensure that you didn't miss anything. There's legal liabilities, etc. But with all those caveats, if you're helping them to, to kind of get information faster, make decisions faster, I think it's going to be beneficial in the long run for for especially for the smaller smaller to mid-sized companies. Yeah. So one, I, I love all that. And it sounds like Part, part of it is, you know, consuming more information, obviously, reading faster and having a backlog of messages and emails to sift through. Um, you know, I'm thinking about the, the people that have, you know, 5,000 unread. And it's like, like, like you said, there's, there could be critical information that they're missing in that. 
Um, but one of the principles that I, I've talked about for a while, and it's been a while since I, since I visited this, but I call it, it's called cognitive offload, right? And so you, you, you take as much mental bandwidth and you, you take it away from the person and you say, what is, what is the AI capable of doing right now? You know, computers for a long time have been able to do math much faster than humans. Why? So what we do, what we do is we use Excel and other things to have the machine do math for us. Why? Because math is mentally taxing, but now it can do a lot of reading, right? And reading is also, it's, it's slow. It can be mentally taxing. Not everyone likes doing it. Some people, even if you do like reading, you have a finite amount of hours in the day and a finite amount of pages that you can read. And so, you know, whether it's unread emails or, you know, legal contracts was another example. So, you know, and, and as you said, if one of the, if, if all you do with this is just have it help read, th- read more and read faster, that can result in e- either better decisions or faster decisions or ideally both in, in, in an ideal world. So this is, this is all really great. So we've, we've been on the call for a little while. So let me, let me take a step back and, and, and just as, as we start to wind down, like, what did I, what did I not ask or what, what are the, what are the things that you're, that you know most about or are most passionate about that we didn't get to in the, in the call so far? I think you covered really most all of the most important things. I think I think the only thing that I would that I would add is is you know the 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 possibility of of having AI really come you know to 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 be utilized in 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 day to day life more and more. That's going to create, in my opinion, that's going to create positive effect in the long term. Uh, in the short term, that that you know there will be probably disruptions in in certain sectors. But overall, I think they you know, in, in a long term trajectory, I see this as a, as a very positive de- development and it's going to really help improve societies in, 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 in general. And so if, if I want if, if you want to kind of summarize that, the way I see is, is this combination of, of having artificial intelligence play a, a greater role in reducing subjectivity, improving decision making, reducing cognitive off, offloading cognitive load. I think all of those are super positive developments that that I'm excited that I'm excited about. The other thing that I think we didn't address, and maybe this is a, a maybe it's a future video for you, is is how do you you know some of the things that that you have used in your videos that I've been following for a while, which is you know some of these concepts of latent space and how re- re- really how capable of, capable LLMs are. How do you utilize that for, you know, enabling even better decision making in, in the long term, right? I mean, what else can we actually give, enable LLMs to actually do or have AI do that, that we are not doing today? And, and that, that would be another, uh, you know, interesting possibility to explore. Maybe I just have one of your videos. <laughs> We're still and constantly discovering new capabilities and all the while the underlying technology is advancing. So this time next year, I'm sure we'll be talking again and there will be a whole new set of capabilities to to discuss. Well, Rishi, thanks so much for jumping in. It's been incredibly illuminating to talk to you and learn about operations management and improvement and the consulting side of things. So thank you so much for, for jumping in. And, and yeah, I look forward to keeping in touch and seeing where all this goes. So thank you.